Today we'll be in Romans 9. We started Romans 9 last week, got about the first 13 verses in. So we'll pick it up there. Of course, the way we've been starting our study of the book of Romans, we always start Romans chapter 5, first 11 verses. J.C. O'Hare said that uh, anybody newly saved and anybody that's never done it, they ought to read the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5 a hundred times through and they'll, they'll know everything they need to know about justification. So we're kind of following along that. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, that verse right there says it all. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Okay, great. How about just a tad more? Because I'm thinking some of the... Yeah, there you go. Perfect, perfect. Okay. So Romans 5, 1 to 11, you know, just, again, everything for the church, which is the body of Christ, right there in 11 verses. All right, we're done. See ya. <laughs> Pete and Lee and family, a long way to come to read 11 verses. was. Well, since you came this far, let's start in Romans 9. All right. And we did go through Romans, uh, uh, starting in verse in chapter 9. We actually went 1 to 16, but we're going to kind of pick it up in verse 13 here and uh, really study probably 11 through, or, or 13 through about 10, 11 verses or so. Romans 9, 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but he, uh, actually verse 12. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. But what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth, er, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the, power, the potter power over the clay, of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also 
in Osi, which is Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Then he goes on, Isaiah also cried. We'll be good to get that far today. Okay, so a lot of things here, and you know, the Calvinists love to run to this about you know, the, the potter having power over the clay, and so we're gonna talk about some of that here today. It just it fits right in with this. Let me start with this though. Where, when it's God Almighty, talk, the Lord God Almighty talking here, and especially back in Old Testament days, back here with Moses and Pharaoh, it's the nations, for, especially with the Jews now, it's the nation of Israel that he's hardening from times and that he's setting aside for times, okay? It's not individual people, all right? So just keep that in mind as, as we get to these sections, okay? So we picked up, you know, last week we, where we were leaving off, off there with um, Rebecca in verse 12, it was said unto her, the, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, uh, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And there again, the Calvinists love to run to that. As we studied last week, all right, Esau have I hated. Yes, God hated Esau for what he did. And we studied that last week, so if you're watching on the internet, go back and watch last week's, uh, you know, Romans 9, 1 through 13. But the reason he hated Esau is because he sold his birthright. Esau knew that all the blessings of Israel were promised to come through, um, through Abraham, through Israel, and that should have come uh, through Esau, but because he sold his birthright, that came through Jacob instead. Therefore, uh, Esau, he hated, Jacob, he loved, because he foreknew, you know, as the Bible tells us, that, that uh, Esau was going to do that. So verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. So Paul's anticipating the question here, much like he's done in the book of Romans. Remember back there in in Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He anticipated the question. So he anticipates it here. Ah, some of you studying with us today, you may be saying, wow, he sounds like an unrighteous God to me. No, he is a righteous God. You know, uh, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. No, there is not. Okay, he was righteous in hating Esau because it was the actions of Esau that he foreknew uh, that caused that. All right, now verse 14. So is, verse, verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Verse 15, for he saith to Moses. Then we're going to get to 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Okay, so we're going to see two um, explanations here. For, okay, because... All right, so now verse 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So as we're going to see here, and we're going to go back and look at, at Exodus 33. So go ahead and, and get Exodus 33. We're going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament today. So clear back here, second book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 33. We're going to see all these things have been going on for a long time. And really, we just need to pick it right up in verse 1 of Exodus 33. Exodus 33, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the, H and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, 
unto a land flowing with milk and honey. That's one of those promises that we covered last week as well. Okay, the land that was promised to Israel. Um, unto a, uh, a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Okay, Israel continued to mess up back there, time after time after time. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment, and consume thee. Therefore now put off the ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Oreb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Okay, make, make men, or note of that. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped, every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by thy name, and thou hast also find, found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And we went over that a lot last week also. And he said, I will make of my good, I will make my good, excuse me, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by and I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts but my face shall not be seen. Okay, so Exodus 33, you know, it, it, a lot of this goes right here with um, this passage in Romans chapter 9 that we're studying today. And this whole thing about I'll have mercy upon uh, whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. All right, so all back here. And of course, he hardened. Um, and then when we get into verse 17, for the scripture saith um, unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up 
that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Okay? So now Pharaoh's heart, on the other hand, he's going to harden so that he can show his power. And while we're back there in Exodus, you know, let's pick that story up in Exodus chapter 9. You know, before the children of Israel leave. So in Exodus chapter 9, starting in verse 13, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Okay, stop reading for just a second. We need to go back and see something about this guy Pharaoh, and maybe why uh, his heart was hardened as well. Hebrew, or Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1 and verse 8, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph, and said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Okay, this king over Egypt, he's a type of the Antichrist. Okay, he's an Assyrian, and he's a type of the Antichrist. So you, we pick that up right back there in, in uh, Exodus 1.8. Okay, there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Okay, so now back to uh, chapter 9 and Pharaoh here. Let my people go, the end of verse 13, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, he's talking about Pharaoh here, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I might smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go? Behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that thou hast in thy field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the same shall come down upon them and they shall die. Okay, and of course we know there's 10 plagues that are going to come and you know, Pharaoh's going to experience and the people there, um, the Egyptians. How long were the children of Israel in bondage to the Egyptians prior to this? 400 and some years, right? 430 some years. Think about that. I mean, you ever really think about how long? Basically, Israel was just, once again, set aside. You know, way back here with Abraham, they became God's chosen people. But they kept messing up. Okay? They kept doing it their way. And for 400 years, they're slaves. They're in bondage in Egypt. 430-some years. Let's see, our country was founded in what year? This country. 1776. 1976 would be 200 years, and another almost 40, we're not even 240 years old yet as a country, as a nation, United States of America. Israel was in bondage almost twice as long as this country's even been in existence as a nation. Does that put it in perspective? Wow. That was a long time. They were set aside. They were God's people, but they're set aside there in bondage, okay, because of their disobedience. Time after time after time. And of course, they're going to continue that after Moses as well, during Moses. Even when they get, when they're freed from bondage, 
disobedience is going to come in. Okay, really, other than the, the reign of David and Solomon, you, you just have continual disobedience from the children of Israel. Well, kind of amazing when you think about that. Okay, so the plagues are, you know, and of course the ten plagues come and visit Pharaoh right up until the death angel, the, te the, the tenth plague. But remember, now back to, to Romans 9, in verse 17, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, as we just read, even for this same purpose, okay, and Scripture's God talking, remember that. So God talking to Pharaoh. For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, Pharaoh, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Okay? Because he hardened Pharaoh's heart, these ten plagues are visited so that we can see his powers, so that we can also see what, you know, later on here, the riches of his glory. Okay? And that's where we're going to be heading uh, with all this. Verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Okay? This shows the eternal sovereignty of God. All right? The free will of God. The sovereign free will of God. All right? And these are demonstrations back here. Okay? And God has a right to do as he pleases. Now again, some of this, just, just stay with it till the end of the study here, if it's seeming, oh, wait a minute. Um, you know, especially those of you that might be, if you're watching on the internet, might be leaning Calvinistic. All right? This is not Calvinism here. This is not individuals other than Pharaoh was as an individual. Okay? Because, but again, he's a type of an antichrist. So make no mistake and do not miss that. Okay? There's a lot of similarities between Pharaoh and the whole stories and experience back there in history um, with what will happen in the future. A lot of foreshadowing. Okay, just as there was a lot of foreshadowing of Joseph. He was a type of Christ. There are many things that happened to Joseph um, that happened to Christ. Okay, foreshadowing. Comment there? Yes. Exactly. When he, when he did these things, Pharaoh's heart was then hard. Yes. It wasn't like God saying, hey, I'm hard to Yes. Boom, he hardened yes. his heart. No, God did something. And what Pharaoh saw, his heart was like, oh, man, I'm hard against that. Yes. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly, God Mike. Foreknew his heart. He foreknew it. Yeah. Once again, according to his foreknowledge. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And that's a key point, and it is a key difference. And that, you know, carry that through clear out here, first and second Peter, where he says, elect according to his foreknowledge. Okay, he didn't elect that person just to elect that person. Hey, he looks like a pretty good guy. I, ah, that guy, no, no, he foreknew. Elect according to his foreknowledge. Okay, and that's been consistent theme throughout the Bible. Okay, but he's and he's using, and he you know, now the nation Israel he chose to be his people, and he's God Almighty. He has he certainly has a right uh, to do that, and he has a right to do what pleases him. 
Okay, today we each have our own choice. It is a free gift to the world. I mean, he tells us that consistently um, in Paul's writings. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 21, he died for the sins of those that eventually would believe in him and trust in him and be saved. No, he died for the sins of the world. Everybody sins. So he did make that provision for everybody in the dispensation of the grace of God as listed in Ephesians 3. But it's up to us as individuals to receive that free gift. But today, everybody has that opportunity. Okay, and we're actually we're gonna talk about that in a little bit here. So let's back up here. But, so that is a difference. You know, back here, it, is, it was God's chosen people, was the nation Israel. Out here in the future, it will return to the nation Israel. But Israel rejected Christ. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Okay. They rejected Christ. A year later, they stoned Stephen. National blasphemy. So began the fall. Well, between these is the fall of Israel. The diminishing of them beginning in Acts 7 then, where they do start. You know, they still had that chance for the year, but they rejected again with national blasphemy. Stephen says, Lord, lay not this into their charge. Okay, so then they start falling away at the end of Acts 28. They're low am I, not my people. Matter of fact, that's where he quote down there in verse 25 of Romans 9. He's quoting Hosea there. Okay, so we are back to Romans 9 now. All right, so in Romans 9. So let's pick it back up. Uh, so we just went verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. Okay, God has a plan. He has a purpose. All right, and that purpose and that whole thing with Pharaoh back there was to show as we're going to read, his power and to show the exceeding riches of his glory as well, as the Bible will tell us in a minute. Verse 19, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Whoa, careful who's replying against God. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou... Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Okay, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory? Okay, so many things we're going to see in here. So let's go back and look at these. Okay, um, get Isaiah, and we're going to look at a couple passages in Isaiah here. A couple passages. And the first one, Isaiah chapter 30. In Isaiah chapter 30, let's start in verse 1 here. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Okay, they disobedience. Come, come now to verse 8. Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people. So here he is describing the children of Israel. A rebellious people, verse 9. Lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Go ye out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be upon you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high hall, 
high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of, in the bursting of it assured to take fire from the hearth, or to take water with the out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall your strength, uh, shall be your strength, and ye would not. But ye said, No, for we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall ye flee. We will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they pursue you shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, and as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait, and he will be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall fall it for the excuse me for the people shall dwell in zion at jerusalem thou shalt weep no more he will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of the cry and when he shall hear it he will answer thee okay and he's going to go on and on there um uh, back in isaiah uh, 30. okay now while we're in isaiah let's also pick up um chapter 64. Chapter 64 of Isaiah. And in verse 8. So this whole thing about the potter and the clay now. Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art our potter and we all are the work of thine hand. Okay? So back here we're seeing reference back to the potter and the clay. And think about a, a potter. Um, think about a, you know, a potter. You know, you, we've all done that back in school. You know, at some point, um, junior high or high school, wherever that was, where we had the little wheel going and we took a ball of clay and tried to make a bowl out of it. And, you know, we're making a bowl and, you know, if we mess up, we can just squish it and start over again, can't we? Until we get it right. All right. So the potter has that power while he's forming that clay. All right. So when you think about it um, in this, in that respect, okay. Um, come back to, to Jeremiah now, or come up to Jeremiah. Next book to your right. Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18, starting in verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye. And who's the ye? The house of Israel, okay? Make no mistake, it's not individuals, it's the house of Israel. Uh, verse 6, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation, against whom I have pronounced, turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plan it. 
if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Okay, so again, it's all related to obedience and disobedience. It started in Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to say Genesis 1, you know, 2, 3 in there, and it continues right through to Revelation. The one thing God expects, if, if there's any one thing, it's obedience. Obedience to His Word. And of course, today, the year 2014, is in the dispensation of the grace of God. The obedience that we need to find is in Romans to Philemon, the doctrine for the church, which is His body, the body of Christ. Because it's different than the doctrine back here, which is different than the doctrine here, which is different than the doctrine here. And oh, by the way, it's all different than the doctrine that's going to be out here in the future. We need to obey the right rules for the day. That's Romans to Philemon. And specifically for salvation. It's the gospel of Christ as laid out in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. How that Christ, when He died on that cross, so the Lord Jesus Christ went to that cross. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 21. He who knew no sin, He, Christ, became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Read that passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 21. Great, great passage. The gospel of Christ is that He shed His blood to pay the penalty for our sins. He was buried, took those sins to hell. And on the third day, God the Father raised Him for our justification. And if we'll just trust that and that alone for our salvation, not only are we saved today, but in this dispensation, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 1.13 that we are sealed unto that day of redemption. Yes, once saved, always saved. You cannot lose your salvation in this dispensation. Until Paul was saved in Acts 9, there was nobody that had eternal security. And if you want to argue about the 12, I'm going to put that aside for right now, okay? Um, but, but people would, could lose their salvation. All right, same thing in the future. People can lose their salvation. Don't believe it? Just read Hebrews chapter 6. Just read Hebrews chapter 10. Okay, First and Second Peter. He says they have to uh, work out their salvation. They have to endure to the end. He says that over and over, just as Christ said back here in the book of Matthew. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, They had to continue to work for it. They could lose it. All right? So that's what's different um, today. I want to come back to that in a minute. So let's come back to, to Romans 9. So again, it was the nation Israel is what God had been dealing with all throughout the Old Testament. Again, other than when David and, and Solomon were in, I mean, it was just full of disobedience. Those would be the two times where you could really go back and look and, and see obedience, um, you know, for the most part, um, of the nation Israel. Um, okay. So, Romans 9, hath not, verse 21, hath not the power, potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another vessel unto dishonor and another unto dishonor? What if God willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. I mean, for 1,500 years He dealt with Israel back there. And that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy. Whoa, there's the body of Christ, the vessels of mercy. And He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And in verse 22, it said he endured with much long suffering. All right, you can't miss the part there about long suffering. Let's go grab a verse about long suffering. How about 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1.
and in verse 16. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy. Of course, this is Paul. Obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Whoa, there's that long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. That in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Now remember what Paul was doing back there in Acts 7 and 8. He was a ringleader at the stoning of Stephen, the national blasphemy, the final straw for the nation Israel right there. He was the one wreaking havoc on the church. He had letters from the chief priests of the synagogue to go throw the church that Peter and the Twelve were starting, the kingdom church, had them bound, thrown into prisons. He got in and testified in court, had many of them committed to death. He was murderous, injurious, he called himself. Okay? 1 Timothy 1.16, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Yeah, the long suffering of Christ. Um, come out to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 3. Knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition um, of ungodly men. Um, keep coming down, verse... Let's just keep reading. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay, once again, the long-suffering here. And we have scoffers, even in the last days out here. Where is, you know, He promised He's going to come again. You know, how long is this going to come? And just before that, you know, because we know that what we just read is doctrine for this seven-year period, and right near in those last days, the scoffers will be there. Where is it? You know, the promise of His coming. Where is, he, where is His coming? All right, but the long-suffering of God. Verse 9 there. Okay, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay? Where is, where is that will of God today? All right, we talked about the free will of God, um, the, the sovereign free will of God. Um, let's come to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1 has several things we can gleam out of here. You know, and what pleases God today is probably the biggest thing. What pleases God today? And basically, it's, it's to save them that believe. All right? So let's look at the Scripture. What saith the Scripture? Verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 1. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay, he used the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's what pleases God today. Uh, you don't need to turn there, but 1 Timothy 2, 4. God our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. What's pleasing to God today? That all men would be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Okay, now he said in here it was the foolishness of preaching. Back up to... Um, 
in 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross, and that's what we're talking about here, foolishness of preaching, the preaching of the cross. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. And if you have a Bible that says unto us which are being saved, throw it away. Because King James says, but unto us which are saved, you have it. Which are saved, it is the power of God. Remember we were talking in Romans 9. The power of God, the long suffering of God, showing the riches of His glory. Okay, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing uh, the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay? God, our, 1 Timothy 2.4 again. God our Savior would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You know that verse 18. What time is it? I may go off on something here. Okay. Verse 18. You know, I become more and more convicted about teaching that the King James Version is the Word of God in English for the year 2000. It is the only uh, Word of God in English. Okay? All these others, it all started in 1881, like the NIV and the ESV and, and all the others. Here's one change you'll see in virtually all the others is verse 18. But unto us, they all say, but unto us which are being saved. How do you ever know if you're saved by the other perversions? And, you know, in, in 1 Timothy, and, and actually go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4, to go along with this subject of how do we know truth? 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul warned it. This is the last book Paul wrote. This happens to be the last chapter of the last book that Paul wrote. So this, you could say, is the last chapter, the last instructions that Paul leaves with, with Timothy, and I would say, and with the church which is his body. And he says in verse 3 of chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Tell me that doesn't sound like today. People don't want to hear the truth. They have itching ears. They, have, they want to hear stuff that makes their ears feel good. Tell me those good fables as it says right there in verse 4. They're turned unto fables. Tell me that prosperity doctrine, man. Boy, pump me up. Help me know that prosperity is coming my way here on this earth. If I just give enough in that plate when it comes to me, as soon as you finish this teaching about the prosperity doctrine, so I'll be pumped up to reach a little deeper in my back pocket, right? Or, or tell me that good positive stuff that just makes me feel good because I have itching ears. Or better yet, let me go to that other church down the road that sings for 45 minutes and we have about 10 minutes of preaching and give us time. We're going to work on that preacher hard enough and we'll get it down to we have 50 minutes of singing praise and worship. And he'll only talk for five minutes so that we feel better. Because boy, we love waving our arms. You know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with singing. I'm just saying at the expense of teaching the Word of God, yeah, they will not endure sound doctrine. Okay, Hey, come to our conferences. Come to the one in Baton Rouge. Last year, Brad Davis, um, who, who uh, has a great group up there in Nashville, you know, they came and sang some good gospel songs for us and uh, songs he's written you know, based on uh, scriptures rightly divided. Some great lyrics. Okay, Hey, we, we sing songs too. He does a great job. He sang down there in uh, um, uh, New Brunfels when we had the conference there two months ago. All right, we'll sing from, you know, some, some uh, good old hymnal songs too. All right, there's some good ones back there. Get to the point, Steve. The point is this. 
People will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want to know. They don't care what the Word of God says. All right, it is, what saith the Scripture? You know, if, you, if people have a question about eternal security, it doesn't matter what, somebody, you know, what that person thinks, what that person thinks. You know, is it once saved, always saved? It's what saith the Scripture. You've got to go to the Scripture. And what do we do today? Now we have things like shows on TV. We've got this new one that just started. You know, they first they did the Bible. The guy, Mark Burnett, that started... Uh, he's got a lot of really uh, successful series on, like Survivor, uh, that show. Mark Burnett, the guy that produced that. Well, he produced this new se series now. Uh, uh, the movie, or the Bible, you know, A.D., so it picks up after the resurrection. And this is like a seven-part series, and, and tonight will be part three, and I'm not suggesting you watch it. I'm in a study group on Tuesday mornings, and these guys are always talking about the last one, and it's unbelievable. You know, it's just like another perversion of the Word of God. People will believe what they're seeing on television. If they, if they don't study the Word, they're going to believe what they see. Well, it must be true. You know, they wouldn't lie. You wouldn't believe this stuff they have in there already. You know, last week was the day of Pentecost. Thank you, Lord, for giving Peter a daughter that was in tune with you enough to convince her father, the Apostle Peter, to get out there on the day of Pentecost and get the twelve and get them praying so that the Holy Spirit could come upon them. It was all because of Peter's daughter. It's unbelievable the role of women that they're putting in this, um, the role of, of Christ's mother, uh, the role of uh, John's wife, uh, getting him to do things. I mean, it's just it's amazing what they're doing. Also, what happened last Sunday night, and again, I'm getting off on some things here. But, so you remember the passage, go to Matthew 27, the passage about when Christ died and they buried him in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathus, right? Matthew 27. Go back there. Because I'm going to, you can, let's just go back and what saith the scripture. So Matthew 27 gives us an accounting of they were worried. They were, the religious leaders were concerned about the twelve stealing the body of Christ. So, uh, Matthew 27, verse 62. So this is when it says the next day, this will be the day after the crucifixion. Matthew 27, 62. Now the next day, after Christ was crucified that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate. Make no mistake, the chief priests and Pharisees come unto Pilate. And they say, 63, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure unto the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so that last error shall be worse than the first. They were worried about it. They remembered the prophecy that they heard. 65, Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now, maybe it's not real clear in this passage what the watch is. The watch is the Roman guard. It is the elite of the elite. It is Navy SEALs of today. By the way, the scripture will say that later on. In this movie, the AD series, the Bible AD, it's religious leaders that went and watched the tomb. Well, okay, that's not a big deal, you say. But let's keep reading because there's some more things that they really change here. Um, come to chapter 28. So we know what happens, right? The resurrection. The stone is rolled away. By the way, if the twelve rolled the stone away, I don't know how they do it, as big as it was, but if they broke the seal, the Roman seal, that's death for breaking that seal. All right? And oh, by the way, if the soldiers fell asleep, that would be death to them as well, but that's what they want them to say. Verse 11 of chapter 28. What saith the scripture about what really happened back here? Pay attention. 
verse 11 of 28. Now when they were going, so this is after the resurrection, behold, some of the watch came into the city. The watch. And maybe we still don't really know for sure who the watch is yet. Okay, either religious leaders or Roman guard, but either way, the watch came in after the resurrection. Oh my goodness, he's not in there. The body's not in the tomb. We better go back and tell Pilate. So the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests, okay, so they show unto the chief priests, all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers. Well, there you go, they're soldiers. It was the Roman guard. They were soldiers. They knew that it's death if they fall asleep while they're on watch. Okay, but let's keep, so notice, they gave them money. They're bribing him. Bribing them, verse 13, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. All right, so the religious leaders are telling the Roman guard, here's some money, if you'll go say, yeah, we fell asleep, they came, stole the body, that's why he's not there. All right, they bribed them. Verse 14, and if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until April 17th, 2015, when the movie, the Bible AD came out and said, no, it wasn't Roman guards, it was religious leaders. And no, Pilate didn't bribe them and the religious leaders didn't bribe them. Instead, he slew them. And that's what they do in the movie last Sunday night. They have them all, just like ISIS, which you see in the films over there. They have all of them come down there and they're down on their knees and he comes with a knife and tsh, slit, slits each one of their throats right there. Tsh, 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 because they fell asleep and let the, Bible, the body be stolen. All right, no different than another perversion of the word of God, changing a word here, a word there. They just change. They, they, so how do you know what's truth? There was an interview not long ago of one of the, the uh, Muslim, uh, what do you call the leaders? Um, uh, not a, uh, of a mosque. Uh, an uh, okay, an imam. We'll just go with that. Um, maybe, that was, yeah, they're, they're the leader of a mosque, right? An imam. Okay. So they interviewed him. He said, you know, how do Christians, you know, real Christians don't know what they believe. They've got so many different versions and they all say different things. Wow, Muslims understand us better than we do. So we've got one Koran. They don't have different versions. And that's just it. People today, it's, it's little by little by little by lot. Yeah, it's just one little word here and one lit. And you say, Steve, you make a big deal out of that story. Hey, just wait till tonight. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more changes that come along. Um, just like, anyway. It, it, are, it is these little changes that make big differences. All right, for crying out loud, in Galatians 2.16, it's, it's just the word of, and they change it to the word in, and all the other perversions. The only version that has the word of is King James. Pardon me. Go there and read it. Okay, it talks about being justified by the faith of Christ. All other versions, so faith of Christ, well, that's Christ's faith. His faith is what justifies us today. All other versions make it faith in Christ. Now it just changed it to our faith, to your faith. Huge difference, because I guarantee you the Lord Jesus Christ has a whole lot more faith, I know, than I do, and I would say than any of us does. All right? That's the difference. It's one little word. By the way, we could back up just eight verses, around eight, verse eight or nine, and it says, and it changes. I don't want to give the wrong, I don't know why it's slipping me right here. Same chapter, Galatians chapter two. Totally different um, passage here. Uh, 
up here it's changed the word of to the word to. And it says the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter as the gospel, uh, gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter as the gospel of the uncircumcision was unto me. The others change that word of to two, so they make it gospel of the circumcision, or the gospel to the circumcision was unto Peter as the gospel to the uncircumcision was unto me. Same gospel. King James, it's two different gospels. Gospel of the circumcision, gospel of the uncircumcision. Two different gospels. Why don't people believe today that Peter and Paul preach, as, preach different messages and to different people? Because of slight little changes like this. 2 Corinthians 11.3 But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, yeah, he attacked the word of God. It was just little change. He just added one word here, and in the next phrase he just subtracted one word there and totally changed the meanings. Just as all the other perversions of the word of God, it's just little changes like that, of the two, of the in. And people say, well, it's not that big of a change. Yeah, but it totally changes. Who's faith? It makes two Gospels one. Wow. The subtlety of Satan. Yes, I would say Satan is behind all the other perversions of the Word of God. And if you think that's blasphemy, at least study it out before you throw us out of another Bible study. All right? It makes a difference. It matters. Words matter. And you can rest assured that when you have a King James Bible in your hands, you have the Word of God in English. It's amazing to me when the King James Version was published. 1611, right? The Authorized Version, 1611. Just a few years ago, we, we celebrated the 400-year anniversary of the King James Version. 1611, by the way, we started this study out talking about how long was Israel in bondage. 400 and some years. How long's this Bible been around? 400 and some years. And boy, they're doing everything they can to throw it out. I guess give it another 30 years and it may be gone. But um, the real point is this. What was going on in 1611 in the world, historically? It's about the time this country was being founded. How about that? It's about the time that power would gradually start transitioning from England was the, the world power at that time. And who became the next world power? The United States. How about that? All of those being English-speaking countries. Why did the word need to come into English at that time? Because of where things were going in the future. All right? And the, the panel of men that were put together by King James to translate into English it's just amazing. And of course, back then, English really was almost a second language to them. They did know Latin. They did know Hebrew. They did speak it on a regular basis. And yeah, it sounds like Shakespeare. Okay, that was the way they talked back then. But anyway, this is not to be a King James study right now. I just, it, it, it matters. Study it out. Study it out. Galatians chapter 2, you've got that issue, that issue. In one chapter, go to Galatians chapter 2. Go ahead and turn there, and I think we will end here. Galatians chapter 2, so that was verse 7, these two Gospels in a King James. If you have anything other than King James, you're going to see one Gospel just going to two different groups of people in verse 7. All right? Verse 16, see whose faith justifies you. If you have anything other than King James, even if you have new King James, it will be your faith that justifies you, not the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20 is the third time they're going to change faith of Christ to faith in Christ. I mean, it's just amazing. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. If you have anything other than King James, it's going to say you live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. 
Three, three major changes there in one chapter. By the way, this is the very first book that Paul, our apostle to the Gentiles, that our apostle wrote. Look what he said in chapter one. The first thing he says after the first five verses that are basically the introduction to the verse, verse six is his first verse and he says, I marvel. Whatever he's about to say, he marveled at. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And therein lies the issue today, 2,000 years later. Oh, by the way, verse 7 says and clarifies, which is not another, but there be some that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So you know he's talking about the gospel of Christ when he says the gospel in verse 6. He clarifies in verse 7, it's the gospel of Christ. Always ask yourself, which gospel? Well, right there, the gospel of Christ. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and raised again for our justification. And it's a perversion of that. They add something to it. Here in chapter 2, in, or in the book of Galatians, they add circumcision to it. Today, in the year 2015, a lot of people will add um, baptism to it. A lot of people will add the gifts of the Spirit to it. Uh, you got to get tongues. You got to get the gift of the Holy Ghost. They've added to it. That's perverting the gospel of Christ to add something to it. No, it is strictly Ephesians 1.13 trusting in the fact that He died for our sins, was buried and raised again for our justification. Period. Don't add anything to it other than that. And then he says in verse 8, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, it's got to be gospel of Christ from the verse before, let him be accursed. And then he says it again in verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Don't let anybody try to tell you you can get saved by any gospel other than the gospel of Christ. Because here in this dispensation, you can't. It's the gospel of Christ. Paul said, let him be accursed. I mean, it doesn't get any stronger than that. And these are the, that's the first book that Paul wrote that became scripture. We read 2 Timothy chapter... So that's the first chapter Paul wrote. And we read a little while ago out of the last chapter... People will not endure sound doctrine. They have itching ears, and they're going to turn themselves unto uh, preachers that will preach fables and satisfy their ears. Does that not describe today? Or they'll make movies that are appealing to the eye and to the senses, and people don't even care if it's true to the doctrine. They will not endure sound doctrine. All right? All um, right. Anyway, thanks for being here today. Uh, next week we'll pick back up and we ought to finish up chapter 9 uh, next week. And then we'll have just a couple more studies. So remember, chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans are kind of separate by themselves. Romans chapter 9 is Israel past. Romans chapter 10 is Israel present. And Romans chapter 11 will be Israel future. And that's why you look at those three as you're studying the entire book of Romans. Okay, any questions, comments, or otherwise on today?